us, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Yeah, 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 yeah. Be magnified, be magnified. Oh, come on, let's sing. We're the whole earth. Over the whole earth, echoing His eminence, His name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We'd hear Christ be magnified. Oh, all across this room, come on and lift up your voice and let's sing. Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. Come on, sing.
rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I hold fast to what is true and if the cross brings come on let's sing it out loud then I'll be crucified with you hey. cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life if I join you in your sufferings then I'll join you of our hearts we offer our whole lives unto you we join you in whatever you're doing in this earth father we thank you for the sacrifice of your son upon the cross that has given us permission to access your presence so lord this morning we thank you for this time of worship and we seal it with a big amen and everybody said and everybody said Hallelujah! Well, listen, we want to thank you so much for being here. There's a family that's walking to their seats right now. I don't know what this little girl's name was, this little girl's name is, but I just want to say thank you for your worship. Thank you for coming down here, for lifting up your voice, for lifting your hands. I just believe 
I just, I don't know what your name is, young lady, but I just believe that God is going to raise you up to be a powerful worship leader. And if we're lucky enough, you'll be a worship leader in this house. <laughs> but I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your worship. Amen. Let's give it up for this young lady back here. And to everybody else, thank you for worshiping with us. As we continue on in the service, greet two or three people around you. What an amazing start to the worship experience here this morning. Aren't you glad you're in church this morning? Hey, we've got folks that are joining us online. Let's make our online audience welcome this morning. Everybody in the room, let's welcome them. Thank you guys for joining us. Hey, whether you're in the room or you're online, we'd love to know that you're with us today. We've got a QR code there on the screen. It's on the seat backs if you're here in the room. If you'll just take out your phone, scan that QR code, fill out a few pieces of information there. It'll help us know that you were here today. If you're our guest today, We'd love for you to fill out the guest section of that, and that will allow us to give you some great information about our church. And we're excited about all the things that are going on here. We're going to continue in our worship and our giving. I want to invite the ushers forward. Ushers, if you'll come forward, you'll notice on the screen you have the opportunity to give in all those different ways. You can give if you're here in the room through the, the buckets that are being passed. But you also have the opportunity to set on some recurring giving through the uh, phone, through your tablet, through your PC. You've got all kinds of ways that you can do that. I want to go ahead and invite the ushers to pass the buckets as they get into place. And I just want to celebrate today that you are a sacrificial giving church. Over and over again throughout this last year, you have been sacrificial in your giving. That's one of the values we have in our giving. And it allows us to fulfill the vision of serving neighbors and nations when you do that. And one of the exciting things that's happening this week that's a result of just the heart that we have for missions, uh, both local and globally, is that we have a group that's leaving this afternoon right after this service. They're going to Colorado City as a continuation of that emphasis we've had in that area. And they're going to go and spend a week there, and they're going to come back and give us a great update of all that God is doing there. And I just want to make you aware of that. I want us to make sure we're praying for that team as they're there. I want you to pray for the ministry that's going on there. And then I'm looking forward to a great report as they come back next week and they tell us all that God is doing through that ministry there in Colorado City. Well, if you've been coming to church for a while and you're interested in taking the next step, you want to go farther, faster in the life of the church, Growth Track is a place where that happens. And we are starting a brand new round the first Sunday of October. That's next Sunday. We've got lunch provided. We've got child care provided. You can see the information there. We'd love for you to partner with us and get signed up for that next round of Growth Track. This morning, we have a ministry emphasis on our youth. We've got several big events coming up in our youth area, but I know our church family Youth, we are excited about what God is doing in your life. Are you excited, guys? On Wednesday nights, I slip in here. I get to see these students in the altar worshiping God. And I just tell you, our next generation of this church is in good hands as these students continue to grow and develop into who God's called them to be. Hey, our students have an uh, event tonight that they've been preparing for. It's a thrifted skate night. You guys ready for that? All right. So if you have a student or if you know of a student that would like to be a part of this 6th through 12th grade, you can see the details there on the screen. You can ask any of these students. They'd love for you to be a part of that night. But what I'm even more excited about is something that's happening a week from this Monday. It's Revival Night. Youth Revival Nights are coming back. And our students are going to be meeting over at the Rose Campus starting October the 4th, 5th, and 6th at 7 o'clock. And they're going to have extended worship. They're going to have a special guest speaker. And they're going to have a time of seeking God. And it's going to empower them into this fall season, into what God's going to do through this next school year. And I know you're excited about our youth ministry just like I am. Let's give it up for our youth one more time. Aren't you excited about our youth? And I'm even more excited. Pastor Ron's about to bring the word. So let's welcome Pastor Ron as he comes and brings the word. All right, here we go. We gotta, gotta, gotta take a, gotta ask a question. How many of you are old like me and you remember when roller skating, that was all you, you had to do? That was it. 
I remember being 13 and my mom and dad would take me to the skating rink and my mom would say, now look, when they do that couple skate thing, you just stay on the side. <laughs> I am so glad she didn't come those nights. <laughs> it's gonna have a good time for these students, love you. So proud of all that God is doing in your life. If you're a Razorback fan, it's a great day. OSU, OU, come on. There we go. Ryder Cup is happening if you're a golf fan. It's amazing. U.S. is going to take it all the way home. Good things. Love being here. Love being in church. Love that you're here. We're talking about new chapters, how God writes them. I'm hearing stories of the work of God in people's lives, and it's going to continue today. If you're here for the first time, this could literally change your life. If you've been coming faithfully, there's going to be a fresh word for you today. We're going to begin in Jeremiah chapter 30. This is message paraphrase. It says, Thanksgiving will pour out of the windows. Laughter will spill through the doors. Things will get better and better. Depression days are over. It begins by saying, God will rebuild the people from the ruins. Their lives were broken. But he's not just going to rebuild them. He's going to write a new chapter, and I want you to see what's going to be in the new chapter. A new level of thanksgiving, because they realize where they've come from. Joy, sanctification that's progressive. Transformation that's going to be unfolding, and it's going to be better and better. Paul said, glory to glory. I love this part. Depression days are over, a spirit of heaviness, a spirit of defeat broken by the power of God that's writing the new chapter. Our focus today will be right here. They'll thrive, they'll flourish. Pay careful attention to those words, thrive and flourish. What is biblical thriving? Let me define it for us. Thriving spiritually means seeking the Spirit's presence, being mindful of spiritual experiences, and responding to its inspiration. Let's take a moment and break this down. There is a fresh heart to engage, to your nurturing a hunger for God, seeking the Spirit's presence. Therefore, your mind is set like a trap. Your heart is set to capture those God encounters you respond to it because there's inspiration. It's like James says, you're not just hearing, but you're now applying what you're hearing to your life. That the encounter with God is an experience connected to a process called transformation. These spiritual experiences fill us with hope, purpose, wisdom, understanding. They motivate and they console. I would sum this up in what Paul said that we know the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and here it is, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. What you're seeing in biblical thriving is this fellowship with the Holy Spirit where He is at work in our lives. I would think that thriving and flourishing are used interchangeably, but not here. I want to give you the biblical definition of what it means to flourish. It's a biblical theme that you can find from Old to New Testament. And when you find it, it's a concept. It's a principle. And the result is peace, blessing, maturity. And it leads to understanding God's loving purpose for you, for the people that God wants you to reach. And you move to this point, and watch this last part, to experience the very best form of life. The best form of life, we must be careful to know that we're getting a biblical definition because a, a cultural definition may just hinge all about success, comfort, convenience. This is the kind of definition that says that I know that God is at work in my life and that I'm not determined by what's going on around me that I have turned from the old and I'm putting on the new. I'm putting on the new in the knowledge of Christ. There is a definite work of God going on in my life, 
And so I'm experiencing God and I'm, I'm finding myself flourishing and I'm flourishing in every context. I'm flourishing in every season. The highs and the lows, the hills and the valleys. I'm flourishing because my flourishing isn't a result of what's happening around me. Amen? My flourishing is because I'm in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and I am responding to the inspiration. I'm being filled with hope and purpose, wisdom and understanding. I'm walking in peace, blessing. I'm maturing and God's revealing His loving purpose in my life. Let's thrive and let's flourish. Amen? We can do this. I want to set it up by reminding you that in Genesis, God created and He said the earth was out form and it was void. So there was no structure and it was empty. And so God over the next three days worked in creation and separation to where there was air, water, and land. The structures that would be necessary for life. Then the next three days, he brought fullness. He filled the air with birds, the water with fish, and the land with animals and people. And if you watch the progression of God, even after the fall of man, and God immediately starts a redemptive process to the point of giving his son and Jesus giving his life, Jesus dying in our place, rising again so that our sins could be forgiven. We could receive the spirit of adoption, move in a spirit-led, spirit-filled life, be more than a conqueror because of Christ Jesus who has won victory and given us that victory. We then live in a life of transformation because he came bringing a kingdom structure and in that kingdom he brought fullness. It's called peace, joy, and strength in the Holy Spirit. So it gives us a pattern. If we want to experience a new chapter, I have to structure my life for the fullness to happen. The structure, I would say it, it, it's as simple as this, a productive schedule. I want to put that on the screen for you. And when you see these words, productive schedule, schedule is the structure. The productivity comes from the things that I put into the structure. And I want to take time today and, and go on this journey with me. I think that preaching is like taking people and we're on a treasure hunt and we're going to leave with some biblical treasure today. And, and the kind of hunger, just imagine if you were on that pursuit. And I, and I get as a pastor and preacher to be the guide, we, we are going to find it today. And we leave with the treasure of God's Word that will continue to make a difference in our lives. So here are the kind of things that we put into a schedule. Intentional wording here, a vibrant devotional life, the right people, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. In my schedule, I'm assessing, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a husband, a father, and a pastor. Each of those come with responsibility. The hats you wear come with responsibility, and those responsibilities make their way into your schedule. God will give you grace and wisdom to live up to the life that He's created you for. But we must make sure that these three things are in this schedule because these three things ensure that it's going to be productive as in honoring God, and it's going to fill you with that best form of life, like the resources of God will be happening in your life. Each of these seems so obvious, but let's go on a treasure hunt today and find some fresh ministry of God when it comes to having a vibrant devotional life. I'm talking about consistency, creativity, you got to have a time and a place and then know what you're going to do when you get into that time and place. And, and I just want to nurture a hunger for this by taking you through Psalm 1. Psalm 1 in the middle has two words. It says delight and meditate. Delight is our energy and heart for the Word of God. 
Our meditation is in that word. That is going to be critical to a vibrant devotional life. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man, and the blessed man is tied to the delight and the meditation. The word blessed is often defined as happy, and I'm all about happy. However, it's much more than that in Psalm 1. To understand it, you go to that blessing that the psalmist gives. It says, I pray that God would bless you, keep you, cause His face to shine upon you, and give you peace. The blessing on your life unfolds to be God's keeping power, God's presence that grows brighter and brighter, and peace that passes all understanding. So when you are blessed, that's the kind of work that's happening in your life. The blessing, the keeping power of God, the, the presence, the brightness of God's glory working in my life, the peace of God, it's tied to what I'm delighting and meditating in. And if I delight and meditate in the Word, I'm going to have this vibrant devotional life. Then he moves and he compares two different people. He says, blessed is the man, here's the first one, that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner or sits in the seat of the scornful. It's showing us a pattern of the old self, of the sinful life, the progression of being led away of my own lust and enticed, standing, walking, sitting. Walking, standing, sitting. It gets worse and worse. However, if I'm delighting and meditating in the Word of God, I recognize that possibility. I quickly move to turn from the old self and put on the new self where God's working in my life. In fact, if, you, if you've got a sinful affection, the best way to dislodge that affection is by the Word of God. Replace it with something better. Here's what Augustine said, a great church father. How sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys which I had once feared to lose. The backstory is that he was being dealt with by God. He was a very evil, broken man. And he said, all of this sinful pleasure that's in my life, if getting saved means I have to give it up, then I'm not interested. But he came to the day he surrendered his heart to God. And watch how he describes it. How sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys. He realized that sin was pleasurable but for a season which I had once feared to lose. You drove them from me. You who are true, the sovereign joy, you drove them from me and took their place. This is transformation. This is not at one moment everything changed. Salvation, you go from darkness to life, unrighteousness to righteous, but then transformation starts. And where there are sinful affections that have lodged in your heart, you dislodge those by replacing them with something better. And as you meditate, as you delight yourself in the Word of God, just like for Augustine, he's going to drive those things away, and you're going to realize that they're nothing but fruitless joys, that they don't even compare with what God is working in a fresh and transforming way in your life. Sin has no match to the grace and graces of God. Sin has no match to the fulfillment that Jesus can give you. So in this vibrant devotional life, transformation, it is happening. And so he says, here's the sinful man, but now compare it. Because you delight and meditate on the Word, you're like the tree that's planted by the rivers of living water. Your fruit comes forth in its season. Your leaf never withers. And whatever you do prospers. That is the blessed and best form of life. Do you see the spiritual implications? Starts with placement. My heart 
is planted in the Word, then life is not in cycles, it's in seasons. And if you're stuck in a cycle, we need to pray that be broken, and you go from season to season. And the productivity, the influence of your life will come forth in its season because you're resourced to make a difference. I love this, but in any season, you're alive. You're dynamic. Your, your leaf doesn't wither. That tree in my backyard, it's been thriving over the summer, but when it changes over and winter comes, you would think it's history. But see, what's going on around it and the implications of, wither, of winter cannot touch the life that is in the root. I'm telling you, season by season, there will be a fresh faith and a fresh power and a fresh grace. And do you see, the, all of that, it, it spins back to if you delight and meditate on the Word of God. Let's drill a little bit deeper. What does it really mean to meditate? When, when I meditate, I am centering and beholding. I'm centering my attention on God's Word. Then I begin to behold. I begin to see Him. I begin to see the truth that He wants to inspire to my heart. This is where you leave just having a Bible plan. I did my reading today, and I'm on about my day. That can lose the vitality. This is where you're having a vibrant time in God's Word. When Psalm 1 talks about this amazing meditation, it's where the information you're receiving gets unlocked, and you experience the enormous power that is in the Word of God. This is where the inspiration happens, and you start receiving strength that is coming from the Word that is circulating in your soul. There are three Psalms, or four, that talk about meditation. Psalm 1, and the meditation is foundational. You can be like this guy who is walking in compromise. He'll get to a worse place. He'll be standing in sin and sitting in a place of scorn and guilt and shame. But if you delight and meditate, You'll be like the person who's planted in the Word. You're strong and you're thriving because you've got the resources of the life of God. You're being productive. Your fruit is coming forth in season. You're thriving regardless of seasons. Your leaf never withers. And whatever you do prospers. John said it like this, that your soul would prosper. You'll prosper as your soul prospers. So many people, their life gets bigger out here, but their soul gets smaller. Years down the road, they, they talk about the brokenness and being burned out. I'm going to the state of Alabama in a few months, and I'm, I'm going to be doing ministry to all the Assembly of God pastors in Alabama, and they want me to speak on this, and listen to this. 96 92% of the pastors that begin ministry don't finish. Only 8% of those who start in full-time ministry finish in full-time ministry. They said, come talk about what's going on with the 92 and what is going on with the 8. I can tell you the 92, their world may be getting bigger. They may have a bigger church, a bigger budget, and a bigger building. But those things don't guarantee spiritual life. And your soul can be getting smaller while your world around you is getting bigger. This 8% that are thriving, they have put their delight not in crowds and not in budgets and not in buildings. All of those things have their place. They have put their delight in the Word of God. They're meditating. And when they get into season after season, they're still thriving. They're still, come on church, they're still flourishing. Because the gospel works. Come on, give him a strong, passionate praise today. The gospel works. Thank you, Jesus. 
Psalm 39, it talks about meditating and it just says it like this. God, as I meditated on you, my heart grew hot within me. Jeremiah said, your word's like a fire. It's like shut up in my bones. I, I got to share it. Whew. That'll change a devotional life. Psalm 48, when you meditate according to Psalm 48, you're bringing all things about God into the present. And it's saying in that time you said, you're the God of yesterday. You're the God of tomorrow. You was, you will be, but you are. You're right here. You're right now. If you healed in the past, you can bring healing today. If you brought peace in the past, you can bring it today. Your meditation has brought you to a place in the presence of God where now there's becoming an encounter with God and there's peace, there's wisdom and understanding. God is at work in my life. I love this. Psalm 119 is the final one that talks about meditation. And the psalmist there talks about as I meditate, I, I move into a reckoning. It's a mathematical term. It's an evaluation. Here's the way Paul said it. I reckon that the present suffering, this present suffering, is, I love it, is not even worthy to be compared to the glory, the weight of glory that shall be revealed. So when you're meditating in the Scripture because that's where your delight is, when you suffer, and you will, seasons come, seasons go, when you're in a season of suffering, you're not losing your walk with God because remember, your meditation is foundational. You're planted, and your meditation allows you to reckon where while you're suffering, you're able to say, God is still in control. I don't see it, don't understand it, but I know that God is in control. We've all had those things that came out of nowhere. God, why this? Why now? Unbelievable, unspeakable things, but it didn't catch God by surprise, and we're able to reckon that to be true when we're in the meditation of the Word. Go with me today. We're finding treasure. I'm able to say, I'm suffering, this is hurting, but I serve a God who specializing, who specializes in taking those things that the enemy meant for evil and for destruction, and he can turn them for good to the saving of many people. Go with me today. When we're meditating, we are able to say, I'm hurting. But God must be working something dynamic. See, you have a whole different way of evaluating. When someone who doesn't know Jesus, they have no way to evaluate like this. This is the, the kind of people that can suffer in faith. These are the kind of people that say, I'm hurting, but he's still God. I am so confused right now, but he's still God. This is the lowest valley I've ever been in. But I know the shepherd of my broken heart is with me, and he's going to walk with me until I get out of this. I reckon that the present suffering doesn't even compare with the weight of glory. Come on, church, that shall be revealed. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. See, it changes it, doesn't it? See, it, it, it can't be, I've read my psalm, I've read my proverb, I've read my chapter. Read and meditate. To the point where you can say, I can't wait to get back to my Bible time tomorrow. This is my delight. And as I meditate, it opens the enormous power of what I'm reading. Thank you, Jesus. God is a fountain of living water. When you meditate, you receive that refreshment. 
God is a treasure worth selling all of your possessions. When you meditate, you make a full surrender. In His presence, there's fullness of joy. And when you meditate, you experience that measure. See, you've created the structure. Now God can feel the structure. Number two, if we don't hurry, we won't get home until the Dallas Cowboys play tomorrow night. <laughs> the right people around you. Not just people, but the right people. Galatians says that let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us. It's a team, a family. I pleaded with you. Find a group, the right group, the right people. Here's why. They fight with you and for you. They fight in prayer. They fight in support. They, they fight in believing in you and believing with you and for you. You have those people? Makes all the difference. See, I'm putting into my schedule a vibrant daily devotional life and the right people best illustrated by Daniel. Daniel gets kidnapped and he's taken to Babylon. And he doesn't let Babylon happen to him. He happens to Babylon. I say with conviction that you don't have to let life happen to you. Set the structure. Set your schedule. Put the right stuff in your schedule. And you happen to life. I know we're living in times of confusion and there's a lot of fear out there. Don't let the fear happen to you. You in faith happen to the the culture we're living in. Don't let the confusion happen to you. Have the clarity that comes from the Word of God. Don't let the end times just happen to you. Let's happen to the end times. Yeah. See, we have a choice in this. We have a choice just to survive or thrive and flourish, grow, turn adversity into the nutrition of a spiritual champion. We have the opportunity to make a difference, to say we're not out here wondering what to do. We've got a compass. We have a magnetic north. We understand biblical principle, biblical values. We have biblical convictions. And I'm happening to life. Well, back to Daniel, who by chapter 2 is now part of the executive team called the wise. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he says to those nearest him, I want the interpretation. He didn't trust anybody around him. It just blows my mind. Can you imagine a political leader that didn't trust people around him? That just blows my mind. <laughs> Who'd have thought? But he didn't. So he said, look, you can't, I'm not going to tell you my dream and you interpret it. You have to tell me what I dreamed. Then give the interpretation or I won't know if you're lying. They said, we can't do it. They said, then I'll, I'll have every wise person, this wise counsel, I'll have every one of them executed. Daniel was part of that. When word gets to Daniel... Daniel says, let me talk to the king. He says, king, give me some time. The king said, okay. What did Daniel do? He went straight to his people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He says, Daniel 2, it's awesome. He said, I need you to pray with me right now. They prayed. God gave Daniel the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and the interpretation. He went to Nebuchadnezzar, revealed the dream, the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar can't believe it. Like, wow. Daniel said, this didn't come from me. This came from God. It was turning a pagan king's heart to the awesomeness and the majesty of the one true God. And the victory happened 
because Daniel had the right people. Do you have those people? Because if you do, then you're going to have that prayer support. You will have people that can, can, here's what I call it, can touch God on your behalf. Imagine a church full of those who have their group and can say, pray with me, pray for me. Here's what I need, prayer. And we go to God. We walk it out. I call it a valley walker. Where not only is the shepherd with you, but your valley walker, your brother, your sister, they're there going, let's lock arms. We'll walk this out in faith. We'll walk this out in prayer. We will walk. And when you get a little weak, I'm going to pull you to the next level. Right, people. There's just so much more I want to say. But just know that the one another's of Scripture that spur you on, pray for you, encourage you, it's there for a reason. Finally, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it amazing that because of what Jesus has done, when you get saved, from that moment there's no condemnation? Let that sink in. Like whatever you do, you'll be convicted of sin after your salvation. You'll be convicted and changed because God loves you so much. He accepts you as you are, but He's not going to leave you that way. But you get a position at salvation in the righteousness of Christ. This is what's mind-blowing. No, no other world religion comes close to this. He came down. He came to us. Took our place. Died on the cross so that we could be redeemed. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Watch it unfold. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. How does it practically work out? Here it is. The life that was once led by the flesh is now led by the Spirit. The mind that was occupied by the flesh is now led by the Spirit. The life that was once walking and standing and sitting in places of sin and compromise is now being planted and the Spirit is leading, indwelling, empowering. You know that Hebrews says Jesus is living to make intercession for you. Romans 8 that I'm talking about says the Spirit makes intercession within you. This is amazing. Jesus praying over you, the Spirit praying in and through you. And if you watch the progression of the text, Paul goes to the place where it doesn't matter anymore. Demons or angels, death or life, things in the past, things in the future. It doesn't matter. I've been made more than a conqueror because of him. Who, so the Spirit of God, he's in this intimate fellowship with the Spirit and his mind's being renewed. His confidence is growing. His hope is rising. His purpose is going to be fulfilled because of the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. If you like apples, would you just raise your hand? I'm not talking about the phone. This is the only apple I like, honestly. I wish I liked the, the kind that you're talking about. But it, it, let, let's say, you know, the fruit. If I said, okay, you like apples, how long would it take for me to grow an apple from my arm? Well, it's not even possible. Because the apple comes from the apple tree. Now follow this. We're going to get some treasure right here. I need to, to love at a level that's beyond me. I need joy at a level that's beyond me. Peace at a level that's beyond me. Gentleness and goodness that's beyond me. Self-control and faith at a level that's beyond me. Why? Because it's the fruit of the... So I have to engage, develop my relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
I have to abide in the vine. And if I abide in the vine, then I can walk in what otherwise is impossible. Imagine the New Testament church walking in this level of love, joy, peace, self-control, gentleness, goodness, faith. And that's what's available. But we have to be intentional to put this priority of developing our relationship with the Holy Spirit into our schedule. That's where the structure takes on fullness because you have the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life. I'm particularly drawn to the fruit of the Spirit of faith today. I believe there's such a call for that. And, and let me explain. Faith in the list of the fruit is not your statement of faith. That's at salvation. By grace, my faith in His grace, I'm saved. I'm adopted where I can cry out, Abba, Father. Spirit's leading my life. He gives me purpose. I'm going to heaven when this life is over. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's my statement of faith. The fruit of the Spirit that is faith is trusting God at a level to do things that I've never seen done before. Trusting God at the level of a God who Paul says can do immeasurably more than I could ask or even think. You can ask for great things. We can think great things. But this fruit of faith takes me beyond where my thinking stops with a trust that it can happen because I'm going to the one who has no limits. He's not limited by my boundaries, by my limitations, by my gifting. He's God. I mentioned the Ryder Cup. It is happening right now, and I, I never watch it without thinking about Arnold Palmer. He's one of my favorite golfers, and it was five years ago yesterday that he passed away. My favorite story about him is when he played a few exhibition tournaments in Saudi Arabia. And that Saudi king, that Saudi prince, said, hey, before you go back to the States, would you give me a few golf lessons? He got to stay in the palace, fly around on the prince's private plane, going to these golf courses, giving him lessons. After a few days, it was time to go. And the king said, I want to give you a gift. He said, the way you've treated me, it's gift enough. You don't have to give me anything. He said, no, I'd be offended if I can't give you a gift. So Arnold, he goes, you know, I, I have this souvenir room, and I have golf balls that are historic and golf clubs, and he really liked to, to get these golf clubs. And he says, so just give me a golf club. And he's thinking the Saudi prince is going to give him a gold-plated putter or maybe an iron dipped in gold, and he'll put it in his souvenir room. The king said, no problem. A few weeks later, Arnold is back home. Courier knocks on his door, gives him a package. He opens it. It's a deed. It's a deed to a 36-hole golf course, country club, swimming pool, restaurant. He goes, what is this? He goes, oh, I get it. He goes, when I say golf club, I'm thinking iron, putter. <laughs> When you say golf club to a king, he's thinking acreage, 36 holes, country club. And Arnold said, I learned when you're talking to a king, don't ask small. So. God, help us to find this treasure. You are a person of faith. And when you develop this intimate fellowship with the Holy Spirit, it grows faith among the other fruit. And that faith is to say, I'm not going to ask small. 
because I'm talking to a king. I'm not talking about heaping up to your own interests. No, because when you're delighting and meditating in the word, you're going to ask big on behalf of the mission that God has given you. And in your business, because you're missional and you're sowing into the kingdom, you say, God, make it as big. God, I have faith for this next level, this next season, this, this next step. As a pastor, if I was going to put a number and say, I want to pastor a church of 2,500, the king would say, 2,500? Why not 25,000? This great pastor in Korea, he just passed away. He pastored the largest church in the world of hundreds of thousands of people. At four in the morning, he would have 25,000 people in a prayer meeting, and he was asked over and over again, he said, how did this happen? He said, my faith, my faith in God. It wasn't about me. He said, it's all of what God can do when you trust God. Oral Roberts talked about getting a vision, and he had gone to heaven, and there was this huge warehouse. And he goes into the warehouse, and there's these, all these miracles, supernatural things of God. And Oral Roberts says to God, what's all of this? And God said, these are all the things that I would have done. If you had just asked, and out of that dream, Oral said he would spend the rest of his life believing big. You're believing for your marriage. You're believing for your family. You're believing over your future. Grow the fruit of the Spirit, which is faith. And when you pray over those areas, you're praying, come on, church, to the God who can do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything that you could ask or think according to the power that is at work in you. Give him a great praise today. We're on the winning side. Thank you, Jesus. Let me invite the worship team to come back and let's, let's conclude back again. Look at this definition of human thriving. Here's what the Bible means. It means seeking the Spirit's presence. Being mindful of spiritual experiences. God encountering you. You respond to its inspiration. The enormous power that's being revealed. These experiences fill us with hope, purpose, wisdom, understanding. They motivate I feel a spirit of motivation in this room. That's the Holy Spirit. He's encountering us today. I feel this measure of comfort that's helping a hurting soul because you've been through a lot. And you may have thought, I got to shelve the dream because now it's just about surviving. And the Holy Spirit is encountering you today and comforting you. And out of that comfort will come your best life. Your future is, is far greater than you can imagine. I would be so bold as to say the best is yet to come. And if you can't see it, you can't reckon that to be true. You can reckon this to be true. God is in control. God is out in front. God never makes a mistake, and God can do immeasurably more than you could ever ask. Would you stand with me, everybody? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're about to have that final work of the Spirit just encountering each of us personally as we process through what He's saying to you right now. As we've gone through that, something spoke to you. And there's an area, if there's something out of order, bring some structure. If it's out of order because of disobedience, bring repentance. All human thriving and flourishing begins at salvation. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, today is your day. Amen, church? Today is the day. Put your faith in God's grace. Be saved today and start this life 
according to John 10, that is so amazing that it's, it's more than abundant. It's a life that overflows. That's the life of God. Be saved today. The next group, you're saved, but there needs to be some structure and fullness. And you know the area. Respond to God. Respond to Jesus today. Say, I just don't know how I'm going to get there. I give you this, this story, and then I, I'm going to open these altars. This guy was trying to summit the highest mountain peak in America. He was close, but he just had run out of all of the strength. He said, I'll, I'll not make it. A more experienced climber came by. Looked at him and saw, he goes, man, I can see your hands are freezing. You don't have on the right gloves. He pulled an extra pair out of his backpack, gave it to him. And the guy said, I just don't have what it takes. He said, no, you've come too far. You're going to make, here's how we're going to do this. He says, you're going to grab my belt and don't you let go. And he said, I am going to carve out steps with every step I take. It will create a step. I want you to, you take everyone I take. You have to hold on and you have to walk. But I will be creating the steps and I will be the extra power. And we are going to the summit. And they did it. If you think, I don't even know how to get from where I am. He talked about a summit today. How do I get there? Take hold of God. He'll take the steps. You step where he steps. And you'll go to the next level, ultimately right on into heaven that he's prepared for you. With eyes closed, you say, that's me. I need his help. As we talk about being a living sacrifice, giving it all to God, I want you to come, young and old alike, from one side of this auditorium to the other, front to the back. Surely you know that the Spirit of God is drawing you. And you just come as a way of saying, I am going all in. I want all God has for me. Lord, I pray on the very beginning of this song that people would just yield to you and you would start writing new chapters. Those that are being saved, those that are rededicating their life to you, those that just know there's more that no one would hold back that you're drawing today. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. As they sing, would you come? You're invited. This is my honor. The gift that I bring. Here it is. I will be a living sacrifice of my heart and soul to love. Let that be the expression of your heart. You come today as the Lord draws you. your prayer surrendered again thank you Jesus freely I lay down my everything cause this is my If that 
that I breathe. This is what we breathe. Everybody, to you, sing it. Lord, I will be a living sound. Let's just lift our hands all across this place. Oh, my heart and soul.
surrendered praise. A full heart, come on, with all that you have. 100, with everything we have, we God. All, with everything we are. That's it, church. We all, with we everything all, that we are. We, we all, love you, we, we praise you, we magnify you. means so be it so you got to walk in this I, I would just ask one thing sometime this afternoon you just decide make a decision in advance of tomorrow of when you're going to have that time with the Lord start now saying what group am I going to connect with and in that devotional time that's where you're developing that relationship with the Holy Spirit and all throughout the day you're having that fellowship, that interaction, and the fruit of the Spirit. That's the way you, you crucify the deeds of the flesh. You grow the fruit of the Spirit. Give me 30 seconds. When you look at Galatians 5 and you look at the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, just before Paul talked about Abraham having Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was a result of the flesh. Isaac was a result of the Spirit. But Abraham had nurtured a love for Ishmael. And it was destructive. And so he had to make a choice. And then you go from the Ishmael Isaac to deeds of the flesh to fruit of the Spirit. And it says you've got to put to death those deeds of the flesh that's putting off but then you put on you put on the new man you put on the new man in the knowledge of Jesus the intimate fellowship with the Holy Spirit where you grow the fruit of the Spirit you dislodge all of this stuff and replace it with what is so much what you've really been looking for all along this is a journey this is a journey we're not where we're gonna be, but thank God we're not where we used to be. We're making progress. God's writing a new chapter. And here we go, the best is yet to come. I love you, everybody. God bless you. Have a great, great day. You're dismissed.